Welcome to the Kitsap Sons Editorial Board. Talking to Port Orchard City Council candidates John Clausen and Nick Whittleton. John, you're the incumbent, so why don't you start? Um, tell us two minutes who you are, what you've done, why you are interested in running again, then we'll get to take the next big chance. Okay. Well, uh, as you mentioned, my name is John Clausen, and I am running for re election for the uh, City Council in Port Orchard. Uh, I have held this position for, I think I'm finishing. 32nd year, uh, so uh, I have been doing this for a little while. Uh, the, kind of the, the reason that I'm interested in continuing with this is that there's a lot of projects in Port Orchard, uh, and I've said this before in re-elections, I kind of want to get some projects finished before I finish, but there always seems to be another project coming in uh, as we finish off uh, one of them. But I do believe that you know, Port Orchard does have some uh, challenges ahead of it that uh, we need to uh, be able to address. I think first and foremost, some of our biggest challenges that we have actually deals with our transportation at work. Uh, we have a couple of major projects that um, we are struggling with, admittedly. Uh, funding is always a challenge, but we have the Tremont widening project that has been designed and um, we're at a point that we are what is classified as shovel ready. We're ready to go. We've actually purchased right away and uh, it's just a matter of having the funding to be able to move forward with construction. That's going to be a very large project um, and that seems to be the biggest challenge is trying to secure uh, sufficient funding to be able to complete that project. When we designed the project, there was a lot of uh, federal grants available at that point, but then with the economy downturn and changes in the way that uh, the feds distribute funding, some of the requirements that they have with that, uh, it's a little more challenging to uh, really not to expect that we're going to find one grant that is going to be able to complete that entire project. So. That is a, a challenge that we're faced with, and we're currently looking at different ways to assemble different funding to pull that uh, together to be able to complete that. The other project that we're faced with in transportation is the uh, Bethel Road. It's an area that was recently annexed into the city in the last four or five years. And we are uh, trying to figure out basically how we can move forward with at least improving the current condition of that road. We just finished about a $700,000 project to make improvements to at least one intersection and some portion of it at the Bethel One intersection. And we need to continue that project moving forward. So we're looking at those as two major transportation projects, but we're also faced with some other issues. Our uh, utilities, we need to address our utilities. All right, we'll get to we'll get to some of the issues, um, okay. but let's let's do the introductions first. Nick, okay. tell us who you are, what you've done, why you're interested in this. Well, my name, as you said, is Nick Whittleton, and uh, I've I've lived in Port Orchard since 1968, and uh, kind of grown to love the town a little bit, and uh, retired out of the shipyard. Twenty years as a the last 20 years I was a manager, uh, various projects, uh, gained a lot of uh, knowledge and skills in planning and estimating and uh, stewardship of the, of the tax dollar. Um, the reason I want to be uh, on the city council is to provide a little uh, communication back to the citizens. It's a big deal. Um, and over the past five or six years, uh, since I've been attending council meetings on a fairly regular basis, um, I've seen, seen some ethical lapses in the council. never step into a new job knowing everything, but uh, you just 
just know where the beginning is and you start there. Good a reason as any. Let's talk about the transportation just a bit. Um, of course, you just kind of, you, I think you just kind of laid out <laughs> my question <laughs> for me, but one of the things the council's talking about is impact fees, having developments start paying for some of these road projects, especially the new ones and, and where that growth is going to go in the city. Um, where are you at on that issue in general? What are you, kind of what are you hearing um, as you do listen to people, listen to developers, attend some of the public things? And what would you like to ultimately see? What do you think is a fair thing to do um, that also takes care of some of the needs? Well, let Nick go first. Um, uh, I think impact fees are necessary. Um, impact fees will not pay, uh, you know, you, you can't get a, put out a bond and expect impact fees fees to pay for that bond because you don't know that you're going to have a, a steady number of houses being built or or anything. It's it's more just a, to show in kind of good faith that we're trying to raise funds where we can. Um, I think it's reasonable that, that development that is bringing impact pay a portion of that impact. How, how do you think through what's appropriate, or how do, what do you listen for? Well, there's a list of projects that we have in the city that that are are needed. Bethel, Tremont. Um, there's uh, some smaller projects uh, out on Old Clifton and uh, on Pottery that that really need to happen. And uh, basically, I agree with what's gone on so far build a list and you go from there. I, I don't necessarily like some of the things on the list, uh, but that's kind of outside our control. We express what we can and see if where the chips fall. Um, I think impact fees are going to be needed as well. Um, I think one of the things that we're struggling with, or at least I'm struggling with, as we continue our discussion with impact fees, is how to do it fairly. We do have a list, as, as Nick mentioned, of projects. Um, we have to be careful of what projects are expected to be funded by impact fees and which are not. Do you uh, agree with everything that's on the list right no, now? No, I do not agree with everything on the list. Uh, you have to have a list of projects that uh, are beyond simply your current deficiencies that truly are going to be a problem as a result of additional development. Those are the ones development should be contributing towards. But when you have projects that Bethel Road is a good example, uh, we have deficiencies in Bethel Road right now with our current level of population. We need to figure out how to fund that without impact fees. Now, as impact occurs, as development occurs, and certainly they can contribute to what you anticipate to be increased traffic. Um, one of the other challenges that we have is making sure that it is being done uh, equitably or fairly. As an example, uh, the, the projects that Nick mentioned on Old Clifton Road truly are going to be impacted by the development in the west side of our city. They necessarily won't be impacted by development that occurs over on Bethel, as an example. So how you put together an impact fee system that uh, uh, charges, if you will, people in the west side of the city or development in the west side of the city uh, and not charge them for impacts that need to be done on the east side of the city. Those are the challenges. What about the idea of a transportation benefit district? I think that's been raised in Port Orchard where you could target one, you could make it big. Um, is there a better or worse way to do something like that? Is that an appropriate tool? Well, it is an appropriate funding source. Um, it uh, charges everyone that is currently in the city. Um, I don't know that it's really reasonable to assume that that's going to help or you should use those funds to help with those projects that are going to occur because of development. That is a funding source that probably could be used to help with the deficiencies that we currently have. As something, well as something you'd be open to, I guess, as well. Yeah, I certainly would be open to it, but, you know, we really need to 
to move forward with that carefully. One of the things that we've been told, for example, is that um, unless we had a transportation benefit district in place, um, we are going to fall behind other grant requests. And you, you basically, they're going to look to the community to be doing something to help fix their own problems before they're going to be interested in handing you federal grants, for example. So in, I think it's something that's coming. And in your opinion, I'll ask Nick the same question. Um, with benefit districts that use car tabs, mm -hmm. for example, there is a there is a way you can set that without the vote of the public. That's correct. Would you be comfortable, or does it have to be something where folks in town get to vote on this? I would prefer that the folks in town vote on it. Um, you know, car tabs are a very sensitive subject with a lot of folks in the community, and. They do allow what they call councilmatic for, I think it's $20 yeah, currently, and they're yeah, talking yeah. about after you do it for so long, you can raise it to 40 But I still think that's a pretty major impact, and I'd rather see the voters have some input on it. Yeah. Do you have any opinion on transportation district car tab tax? Well, it, it, I think it serves a different purpose than, than the impact fees. Do you need that's to have both of them? To well, the, the roads in town need repaired and you can't use impact fees for general right. repair right. so you have to have something to, to fall back on and um, up until now we have nothing uh, we, we need something and but the people need to the people need to step up and understand the the problems that we're faced with and uh, either agree or disagree um, and then your comfort level with if Transportation benefit district is a way to do something and use a car tab fee. Does it have to be something that everyone have a general vote on? Is it if there's a way to do it with just the council? Are you open to that? I, personally, I'd feel more comfortable with everybody stepping up and saying, or the majority saying. How do you room. how do you communicate? What would your strategy be? And John, I guess you've probably been trying to do this. I would imagine um, is explaining that issue to your to your city to your constituents um, you kind of in your opening marks mentioned communication that you thought there's a deficiency of communication during the next four years how are you going to tell people we've got to fix the roads and here's the ways that I think we should do it how do you get that message across what's your tactic I, I think town hall meetings are are uh, they've been a great tool um, I've been I've attended I think I've only missed a couple of them that we've had past three and a half years um, you get a lot of input you get a lot of, of different people showing up for those than you do uh, council meetings and uh, gatherings there's a, just a different group of people that show up and, and it's a better cross-section and I think it should be expanded and uh, right now I think they the mayor has them quarterly and Monthly would be do it more often. Yeah, do it a little more often and, and advertise them a little better so people understand what's going on and that they can bring general prompt questions. John, how, how do you think the council, current council or the city has done in communicating this issue? Not very well. Uh, we're, we constantly struggle with um, how do we get the word out and how do we improve the. Uh, especially at um, you know public hearings and those types of that's a specific issue um, one thing that we have done in the past that I think would be beneficial and that's taking these kind of community meetings that Nick talks about um, out of City Hall uh, as an example we held some meetings within the McCormick Woods area itself and that helped an awful lot for getting at least that segment of the city to attend, and we've held in the past meetings at, for example, the Cedar Heights Junior High School uh, that did pretty well of, of getting folks together. So when you have these kind of major citywide issues, having a series of meetings that we try to go to them uh, helps, but it's it's a challenge. It's a challenge not only in Port Orchard but everywhere. Here, I have uh, a okay. Go ahead. Um, I'd like your thoughts on whether um, there should be um, city council districts 
for elections or have the, the members be at large. And then my second question is, are you in favor of a council city manager uh, form of government? First, sure. Uh, I, you know, I'm kind of mixed on districts. Uh, I have the opportunity in my full time position of working with all of the jurisdictions in Kitsap County, and I've seen how districts have worked in some cases uh, for the betterment of communication, and then I've also seen where it creates. Um, I only care about what goes on in my district kind of attitudes, which I don't think is really What's a your good thing. Time? Do you have a full time? I have, yeah, I work for Kitsap Transit uh, in my full time job. So, um, I think if I had to make a decision right at this point, I'd say having at large is better. I certainly, in my position, when I look at something at the City of Port Orchard, I look at it citywide. I don't look at it, um, I mean, obviously, if it's something that's only going to affect the neighborhood, you do. But if it's a big issue like car tabs, for example, or road improvements or something like that, I really try to look at it from a citywide perspective and what's going to be best for the city. And that's not that if you have districts that others um, don't. But I've just seen that there has been, in some cases, a tendency where people get focused just on the impact of their district. And I don't think it's a good thing. Your question about council uh, manager form of government, uh, yeah, I, I would be in favor of that. Um, I was when we put that issue before the voters before. That's my personal opinion, but you know the voters have, have expressed their feelings. Mm -hmm. so. We have what we have. I see challenges uh, in the system that we have. I mean, we're reaching a point in the city of Port Orchard where it it's a pretty major corporation. And to have the executive change potentially every four years comes with challenges. Um, you don't necessarily get a professional manager. You get somebody that is popular. And that isn't necessarily best for the city. When you talk about council positions, you are popular as well, but you're balanced because you're only one of, in our case, seven. So you have to work together to reach consensus and, and try to come up with you know what's best for the city. Um, I actually uh, think that um, the at-large at I would, I would prefer districts in the city um, just to kind of get it spread out. Port Orchard has been a pretty compact uh, city up until recently with the addition of McCormick Woods and, uh, and the Ridge and out Bethel. It's kind of it's kind of growing with, with potential for more growth and I think uh, I think each McCormick definitely has different thought process for Port Orchard than uh, the downtown core or, or East Port Orchard or even out Bethel. So I, I think we are growing to a point where we need more district representation rather than at-large re representation where you have a, a number of people in a small area. Um, city manager, I think we're, we're kind of at a, at a crossroads. We're not really big enough to warrant the city manager, uh, as I understand the city manager job, but we're we're getting there. Uh, I think uh, a larger city is is more appropriate for a city manager. Our problems are are not as grandiose as a Seattle or a Tacoma. Uh, how how would you? What, is, what would the city manager do that the main mayor does not do, or vice versa? Um, in my opinion, the mayor is more, uh, he answers to the people. A city manager would answer to the council or to the mayor. 
which uh, kind of uh, allows the city manager position to be uh, more politically focused than a mayor. A mayor has to make 50% of the population happy every, every four years. A city manager has to make 50% of seven people happy. What is what is an appropriate size? I mean, you, you're saying there is you're saying there is a there is a size of the city. There, there's a, once once a city starts getting more complex issues, I think our issues seem complex to us. You know, seventeen million dollars for a street is a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, but is that you know we got a couple of street problems. I only ask because the two comparisons you use for Seattle Tacoma clearly Port Orchard yeah. will never be right. bad, well, but it will be <coughs> Port. You, you know, know, you got Port Townsend, Port Angeles. Yeah, something um, like that. They're they're a little more robust actually than than Port Orchard yeah. is. I wanted to ask about the. You were saying, John, that it's a you know you have a seven person council and you work by consensus. So how do you? both feel that that works now, or does it work the way you would like? Well, uh, you know, I personally liked it. I think it balances it, and it make, it forces each one of us to sit down and look at all sides of the issue, if you will. Um, early on in my career there, we used to always, it seemed like all of the votes were unanimous. And I was asked, actually, by one of your former reporters, does that ever bother you? Well, at the time, we were actually, I take that back, we weren't unanimous. We were always three to four in a decision. And they asked me if that bothered me, and it absolutely not. I mean, that's why there's seven of us up there. If it was just a rubber stamp every time, then why do you need seven? So I, I like the seven-member council because it gives us the ability to have, like, three-member committees to look at an issue without it being a quorum, and we can study an issue more in depth. Um, I think three is too few because you don't have that. I think nine is too many. We saw that in Bremerton. Um, but I also look at the city hall. It's kind of like a three-legged stool. It, you've got to have a council, a mayor, and a staff that are all heading in the same direction. Or if one of those legs aren't there, you just have problems. John, something that's come up in the other Port Orchard interviews is exactly what you're talking about right there. Mm -hmm. Having those three um, entities headed in the right direction, and there've been some problems on the current council. Well, and we've heard it. I mean, the candidates have sat here and said this. So I want your opinion of how the council is getting along with the mayor. What have the obstacles been, um, and what? How do you take that on personally? How how do you, things improve? So, I mean, and I'm not saying everyone has to be friends all the time. Don't take it that way at all. Um, but you know, we're hearing some frustration come from some of the councils that things haven't been working smoothly or they felt stymied. Um, and the mayor says the same thing from his point of view. So give me kind of your sense of that. And Nick, you attend meetings, so you probably observe exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think that relationship has been? And what, personally, how do you respond? How do you try to improve things for the good of the city? I don't think it's, it's functioning well today. Um, I think there's a a lack of communication between uh, the, the council and, and the mayor's position. Um, and the mayor's, you know, it's not a secret. The mayor's made comments many times that he doesn't work for the council. Well, that's, that's absolutely right. He doesn't work for the council. We're a policy setting body. Uh, it's his role to administer the policies, but there needs to be communication and we need to be working together, and I don't think it's there. How I deal with it? I just keep focused on what my job is and keep doing the best job I can with it and hope that that will work itself out. Um, you know, as an example, obviously when Mayor Mathis came into office, it was a pretty close vote. Uh, right after it was certified, I actually arranged and had breakfast with the mayor and told him whatever I could do to help, let me know, you know, because I certainly have been around the council long enough that I know how to work with those folks, so if he has an issue, I'd be happy to, to help you through with those issues. And that was the last meeting we had. 
So, you know, I don't think it's working. I've had the good fortune of working. Mayor Mathis is our fifth uh, mayor, or my fifth mayor that I've worked with. And, and it, you know, I don't want to just shoot at Mayor Mathis because there was a previous council that was just as dysfunctional. Uh, we had three members on the council that just seemed like whatever issue came up, it was almost like they're going to take an opposite position. Uh, and it was just very, very challenging. It was a difficult four years. Well, I'll let Nick answer. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm kind of lost on the question now. Oh, I was going to follow up, but I'll, I'll let that one sit for a second. The, the question I wanted to know was your, you go to these meetings, you, you've been observing the council and the mayor and how they mm -hmm. work with one another uh, publicly, and I'm sure you've heard the same thing that John's describing right there. We've heard this consistently. What's your perspective on how the city is working right now as far as policy? And then um, what, what do you bring to that equation? How do you approach that, something like that? Well, it's, it's my understanding that the council, as John said, the council sets policy and the mayor executes the policy. Um, it's pretty, pretty basic. Um, the communication um, is comes back into play, and because from the public side, we don't see the inner workings of or the interrelationship between the council and the, and the mayor. Um, I've said it a number of times. It would have been nice to see what. Mayor Mathis could have done had he and the council got along. Um, and, you know, I, I, I saw what some of the previous mayors accomplished uh, in their time there with a, a council that got along with them. And do I see anything different now than then? No, I don't. I, the, the results part, I don't see the difference in results. Um, I, I do see a dysfunction, and you know, from from the public standpoint, it, do you see? Um, so you don't see results. Are there things that you think could have happened, it's like specific things that have not occurred? I don't. I don't really know. No, correct. You know, it 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 is more from the public side. We don't yeah. we don't see a lot of the inner dealing. Yeah, I don't. I'm, I'm trying to think. You know, yeah. as a citizen, do you say, boy, I really would like that answer, and it just sits there and sits there. Yeah. I can't get momentum for whatever sense. Um, I don't know, maybe you have an opinion on that. Is there something that you feel sitting there that can't quite, is there an issue, is there a project? I'd like to get this done, but we can't seem to run into each other. What, what type of thing does the citizen notice? Well, you know, it's hard to say what could have been or should have been. Um, you know, it's difficult. I just know that it seems like, uh, you know, the big thing is just the communication. I think we could all be on board with, you know, pick a project, uh, tree month. You know, if we were all heading in the same direction, um, who knows, maybe we could have done more, but it's really hard to say um, specific things. <coughs> just kind of walk into it. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I just want to follow up. Nick, you said when you started that you thought there were some ethical lapses. What did you mean by that? I, I think... Um, From what, from from our side, from the citizen side, um, when questions are asked of of the council, we get we really get no answers. Um, the people that I talk with, we get no answers. I don't know that no one gets answers. We haven't been able to get answers. Proposition one, we asked specifically, what's it going to cost? <coughs> we were told, we don't know. A few weeks later, uh, I was sitting, talking to the Board of Realtors, and they had been provided answers by, uh, by another councilman, not John, another councilman, had provided them with cost figures that he wouldn't provide the citizens. In that seven-member group, it's not a vacuum. They they talk. Um, so, I'm sure what one councilman had, 
the rest of them had as well. But we couldn't get that entry. And, and ethically, that's wrong. Um, the, the communication creates, a, creates an ethical problem. Have you noticed that in other things, or was it specific to that issue of with the vote? Um, there's, there's specific to that. There's, uh, um, I personally felt that the, uh, what I've coined the breakfast club is unethical. Um, they've since moved those committee meetings to city hall, but, uh, Oh, they weren't you know. perceived as open? They, they, they were perceived as open because they were held in a public place and the public could attend. If you, were, if you were more than four or five feet away, the public couldn't hear, but they started recording those. And the recordings are, for the most part, okay. Um, These are publicly but, noticed meetings, is that correct? They're, they're committee meetings. They're committee meetings. They're scheduled and, noticed, and right. noticed. That was just one council member, is that correct? That chose that? There was, there was two, two committees. Two different committees that were not held. Right, they at were City Hall they were held in local restaurants. Okay. Um, and I I did not perceive that as ethical. John, does that trouble you at all? <clears throat> no, not really. Um, it was and has been done that way primarily. Uh, some of us work for a living, so we have to try to find times to get together for these meetings, and it's usually either early in the morning or late at night after dinner. Um, it's also an issue that we found over time that it's a better use of staff time. If, for example, I get off work at 5, I go home and eat dinner, and we go down and have meetings. We used to have meetings that start at 7.30. You're asking staff to stay late to attend those meetings versus coming in and starting their meeting during you know, the day a little early. Um, so no, I didn't. Who pays see. for the breakfast? Pardon me? Who pays for the, the breakfast? The city pays for the breakfast. The city's pay. The yeah. city pays. Yeah. You pay for the staff. You pay for everybody. Uh, but the time has not changed of the meeting, just the location has been. Yeah. Well, recently we've changed it to uh, in the evening because of conflicts in, in my particular case with the committee that I chair, it's been trying to find time in my schedule to, to be able to, and it's not just me, I mean, it's the other members of the committee as well, and I have to try to find the time. So the last couple times, I think, Nick, it's been three times, two, three times, whatever, it's been at City Hall at five-ish. How often do these meetings take place, committee meetings? On average, probably once a month. So are there minutes taken for these meetings? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's minutes taken, and there's... They have mentioned uh, we've been recording the minutes, audio recordings for probably a year, I would guess. Yeah. Did you start doing that as a result of this? Of this, uh, um, I don't know. In my case, it's been scheduled more than anything. Okay. <coughs> um, one question we uh, we're talking about things that have got done, and uh, the one. One of the major projects that has been done is the Bay Street pedestrian pathway that goes out, and um, there was a conflict with different opinions on that, but they did figure out kind of the solution that you're trying to implement now. That's helping, you know, get people downtown, us simply have work out like that. One of the issues downtown, especially things like the Myers building, um, there's another property down the street that the city is now taking over and doing things. Do you think when there are kind of these vacant properties, derelict things, should the city have a heavier hand? Should there be some sort of policy that says we have to get something done? We can't let this building sit for, I mean, what's it been, six years or so now? Maybe it's not quite that long, right? Um, but a number of years of, of kind of this stall, things down there. Mm -hmm. um, is that appropriate? Should it, is it up to the market to, when he's ready to do it, he can do it? Or, or should, be, should the city council be more active on issues like that? Um, yes, they should, the city should be more active. Um, there's a number of cities across the United States that have blighted 
uh, building ordinances. And uh, especially our downtown district is so small to have a, a building like that sit for since 2011. Um, not only is it an eyesore, but it's not doing its purpose. I mean, it's not producing anything for the city or, or anybody else. Um, and it's it's really not right. We need to, we need some form of an ordinance that deals with blighted buildings. It's not just Myers. There's others throughout town that are boarded up, uh, which is is more of an invitation for problems than than anything else. And and we really need something. Is this commercial and residential? Yeah. 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 I mean, it's something I mean to have a boarded up house next door. I mean, it really does a lot for your property values. And people perceive your neighborhood. Yeah. John, is that something you guys have talked about, you consider, are you willing to? Well, it's always a channel challenge when you deal with people's property rights. Mm -hmm. Of course. It's and <laughs> I don't know that you can force somebody to spend money in a losing proposition. Uh, you can provide incentives that will help them develop something that, that uh, has a potential for return. We did that with we revisited our downtown building ordinances and we dealt with issues like pipes and things of that nature. Um, unfortunately, the economy came along and kind of stalled that. But it, it is a challenge. Um, I think the most recent example is the city, the city stepped forward with that one location and we ended up buying the property. Um, it is actually less expensive for the city to do that than it was to go through the abatement process and have it torn down and leave the property and hopefully you'll get it at some point in the future. We have done that in the past. Uh, the vacant lot that is next to Myrie's is a property that we finally pushed it to the point where the only option was demolish. Now we have you know, a hole in our downtown area. So you, it's a struggle. It's a challenge to try to find a method that allows the property owner or encourages the property owner to invest in their properties. Unfortunately, we have a situation in Port Orchard that's evolved where uh, one individual in such a large percentage of our downtown that's not a local residence, I mean, lives over in Seattle. It's frustrating, you wonder how you can invest so much money in a piece of property and then just let it sit. Have you had the opportunity to talk to Mr. Sandel for it all? I, I am. What's, what's the response you get, or what's is there any sort of indication you're given if the city would do this, that would be helpful? I have not talked to him in a while. Uh, I, I talked to him early on. The, what I have been told secondhand is that it won't pencil out right now in the current regulations. So, pardon me? Uh, how do you mean current regulations? Uh, in, in his opinion, he needs to be able to build a larger structure than what our permits or ordinances will currently allow. He wants a taller and you know, things that we're just not ready for. Um, is that a vision you would have for downtown Port Orchard? Do you think that's a realistic vision? Taller buildings, more residential? Um, is that, um, is, that, is that something that the council should be looking at? If looking we, at we, we've gone down that road and we've developed what we have now as, if you will, a compromise with the community. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's kind of what we have all agreed on is acceptable. And it's the neighbors on the hill were upset. Yeah, there, there were a lot of people involved in that. The neighbors on the hill certainly were major uh, contributors to the, to the, what we call the DOD developments. Uh, so it's kind of a compromise. We've all kind of come together and said, well, this is what we can all live with. Uh, personally, once again, I think it's an issue that, you know, we can say what we want on a piece of paper, but if it doesn't pencil out for the property owner, you can't force them to invest. And for the city to take it over, we did in this one particular case, but I can tell you my personal opinion is we need to get that property out to someone who will redevelop it. City makes a terrible landlord. 
um, and we're not developers, we shouldn't be. But we need to, as that's one form of an incentive to make, if you will, this property available for somebody that's willing to come in and redevelop. Should, should the city have a more active role, downtown redevelopment in general, than it does right now? Well, our active role is by trying to make the regulations such that it can work for the property owners. But you're, you are, I shouldn't say content, that's probably the wrong word, but there, yeah, there aren't major regulations you think need to be changed right now that would spur something? Well, my personal opinion is just my personal opinion. It's not the consensus that we've all come sure. to agree upon. Um, so I think we've got what we have, and we're going to figure out how to make that work. I'm hopeful that, you know, with the economy coming back and turning around, that uh, it's going to reach a point soon where these property owners are willing to make the investment and can see that it's going to pencil off for them. And I certainly would continue to work with them to try to come up with whatever we can do. Other than the downtown kind of abatement question that I asked, do you think the city is active enough in that kind of focus on downtown, or is that not the top priority? I think I think the city needs to be more active in uh, a lot. We've got we've got an ordinance that that says you can only have your grass 12 inches high. Okay, but we can have a building sit idle like that looking like it does for six, seven years. Uh, it, it's not. So your solution is to what? Well, I, I believe. Have him tear it down or? Whatever he wants to do with it. Just do something. You know, put, put a, you know, put a little lipstick on it. Uh, you know, make it, uh, make it presentable to where people aren't afraid to walk down the streets next to it. Um, Things like that. There's there's different incentives, you know. Incentives, you know, we'll give a little here. Well, there's also, you know, there's an incentive to not speed. Um, I think we can, we should be able to incentivize it in that direction as well. If you're going to allow a building to sit blighted like that, it should cost them something to, uh, you know. And if the city puts that money in a pot, maybe at some point in time they could tear it down. Beyond just that property, um, do you think policy-wise, zoning-wise, the city is doing enough investment in downtown? Should that be yeah. a bigger focus? That, no, that downtown overlay district is a good idea, and I think it's headed in the right direction. All these properties downtown that have been sold have all been purchased <coughs> under full knowledge that that regulation was in place. So, who should change? Yeah. One of the big things, you know, obviously in your downtown there's Port District property, um, you're not yeah. far from county land, just down there's a straight highway that goes through. So there's a lot of different <coughs> jurisdictions that matter to Port Orchard in the future, you know, Bremerton right across the water. John, obviously, you kids have transit, you touch a lot of these different communities, and so you have experience there. How do you, what's your personal background with working with kind of the other organizations? What do you bring to the table as far as you know, being a representative for the city when you're talking to the state, the, the county, um, the Bremerton neighbors like that. How do you think you handle that? I can work with anybody that's willing to work with me. I guess that's the bottom line. Uh, you know, I'm, unfortunately, I'm part Norwegian, so there's a certain amount of headbutting that <laughs> comes with it. You know, you, there comes a point in time when you lock your heels and, and somebody's got to a little on the rope, I guess. I don't, I don't know. I'm, that's one of those that you know, I know I've worked with people in the past uh, and uh, come to consensus, and I'm sure I can do it in the future. Yeah. What's your perspective? I mean, you have a different perspective. You obviously get the friends of the countywide agency, and so you see all these things. How do you, how do you balance that personally when you have the countywide city council did this job over here. Um, how do I keep, keep the two jobs separate? Yeah, yeah. How do you handle different kind of different demands a little? Um, how do you avoid the conflict? Uh, I, I guess I've done it so long that it's kind of second nature. I can certainly identify when there's a conflict. 
and deal with it appropriately. Um, you know, I recuse myself from things that come before the city council if it pertains to kids have transfer, they just don't vote on it. Uh, and I don't even participate in the discussion. As an example, the city of Port Orchard, uh, along with the city of Bremerton and Port Fund, the ferry operation later than what transit is. Yeah. I don't participate in that. One of the things that, though, my my full-time job allows me, as you mentioned, I get to see and be a part of what goes on in other communities. So I see it. It's not unique to Port Orchard. Um, you all have seen things that have been going on here in Bremerton, for an example. Uh, Bainbridge Island has been struggling with the same thing. Paul School happens to be in a position right now where there's a lot of demand for what properties in Paul School. And Personally, I think it has an awful lot to do with its proximity to Seattle. Uh, you know, the thing with Bainbridge Island, it's a 30-minute ferry ride from downtown Seattle. There's a lot of development that occurs in Bainbridge Island. But it's a challenge for all of us. You look at most of the development here in Bremerton. It's all been public dollars that's been invested, things like the new ferry terminal and the conference center and the parks and things of that nature. And, you know, it's wonderful what the city's been doing over here. But you step off the sidewalk and look at the properties. You look at Bremerton, just tore down two buildings over there on Burwell. Um, so it's a struggle for for Port Orchard. It's a struggle for all of the communities. Unless you have something that's driving. Now, who knows what the economic boom that's going on in Seattle and all of the, the building that's going in Seattle that's already spilling out into the home east and down into Pierce County. It's probably how, going to come over to this side of the Well, how do you well. see, maybe, and I realize this is, this is a little beyond the typical purview of a council decision, but how do you see your city fitting in economically with the rest of Kitsap County? What's the role that Port Orchard has? What are some of the things that you'd like to, hey, we could work harder here. Um, we could attract this over here. We could work better there. Where do you think the opportunities are for your no, city? Can answer that yeah, question. let John go first and then have Nick and you know, I think what the city needs to be doing is getting the community ready for and, and ready to deal with it. Now, if we're updating our comp plan is one method. We need to make sure that we're set up for growth. Uh, I think there's other things that the city can do to help prepare the community for that. For example, you know, we've been spending a fair amount of time with undergrounding utilities in the downtown area. One of the side benefits of undergrounding utilities is that we've been able to string some fiber optics along with those projects. That just prepares the city for those types of uh, development to come into Port Orchard and be able to, to operate. I mentioned briefly about our utilities. Uh, we have our, our wastewater facility now has a lot of capacity ready for a lot of growth. Um, we are working on our water utility. We have a, a major well that we just recently got funding that we're trying to connect it into our water system, which will provide us water for growth. Those are the types of things that we need to be doing, as well as this road infrastructure is a real challenge for us. And you mentioned Tremont and Pottery. But just the overall conditions of our roads, we need to be working on our sidewalks so that we can attract uh, some of that growth, if you will. But we've got to be prepared to deal with it appropriately. Yeah, the infrastructure is kind of the key thing to, uh, to uh, allow for growth. Um, and I think as citizens in Port Orchard, we need to accept our role as a bedroom community. It's kind of a nasty word when you bring it up in conversation for some reason. Uh, nobody wants to be a bedroom community, but that's what it is. It's a sleepy little town, and if you want nightlife, uh, Seattle's just across the water. Uh, we are what we are, and uh, as time goes on, you know, I'm sure the, the restaurants are going strong all over the city. Uh, some of the other businesses are struggling. But, and they're the, they're the ones that don't want to hear that we're a bedroom community. We're a 
tourist destination. Well, right now we're a we're a bedroom community. Someday maybe we will be a tourist destination. Yeah. But it's something that we got to set our sights on and, and head in that direction. You know, you describe this uh, bedroom community, small town, and you definitely get that feel in Port Orchard. But then, when I drive through some of those, you know, out of the west or or the other direction, you know, Phillips Road, I see all these houses all of a sudden <coughs> coming in and planting. So, I guess when you look out. Say you're in this for the next four years. This term there. What, what do you see the city looking like in four years? How is it going to be different in four years? Um, what what sort of growth is kind of desired as far as population? I think population. I think ab just absorbing what wants to come. There's plenty of plenty of real estate on the market, and they're building all the time. So the the places to live are there. Um, I think uh, as a city we kind of need to stay focused on getting caught back up. We had those two major um, uh, annexations that took place and we need to catch up with that. Catch um, up with that in terms of infrastructure? In terms of infrastructure. Okay. Yeah, the, the road systems getting to the west side are, are suffering, the Bethel Corridor is suffering. So we're, we just need to catch up and, and then look and, and see what we can do. John, what do you think? Um, you know, the growth is it's going to come. It, it is coming. You've already talked about trying to fix some of the uh, transportation things. But when you look at four years from now, where do you expect Port Orchard to be kind of population-wise being able to handle um, some of that growth? Well, I know it's it's probably an overly used uh, comment about a diamond in the rough, and I really think Port Orchard is. Um, I do expect to see a lot of growth. You know, they've mentioned the residential growth. I think that's going to occur, and we need to make sure that we're ready for it, which I think we are. With you mentioned the utilities that we have, the, the road network is something that we definitely need to work on as far as things like the impact be so that we can deal with it appropriately. But I also think along with that kind of growth is going to come, um, you know, ancillary businesses is going to be supporting that growth, whether it's uh, whatever, other grocery stores or other types of commercial establishments to deal with that kind of, I guess you could kind of look at Gig Harbor as an example of what rapid growth will do. Um, good example or a bad example? Well, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think reasonably, it's it's a pretty good example. I think they've done well. They're struggling with some of their issues in their downtown areas, for example. Um, but I think they've done a pretty good job of planning out their commercial growth and things of that nature. Um, and I think you know we just got to keep focused on those kind of things. Uh, I'm a little biased because I deal with transportation. I think transportation is a major issue. We've got to have a convenient way to get from Port Orchard to wherever these employment centers are. I mean, personally, I'd love to have the employment in the city, but I think we've got to be realistic. Uh, we've been pretty fortunate with some of the development that's been occurring in our industrial park with the Leader Corporation and the Honda and some of those. But it sounds like you're kind of in the same opinion as me. This is a bedroom community that's I think at this point it is. I, I, I agree with yeah. Nick. We just need to be prepared yeah. and ready to support it. Um, we're coming close to the end of our hour, but what I always ask, kind of with this last statement, there's two things you can do. Is one of them, if we've missed something, if we haven't asked you about something that you have been wanting to get out your chest, feel free. This is your chance to do it. But also, um, you know, I, I hear some differences between the two of you, but a lot of the things you seem a little, a little agreement on. But how do you separate yourself from your opponent? Um, what, what would a voter expect differently from you than the person you're running against? I think that's kind of always a question we want to kind of conclude with. Um, we let John start, so this time we'll go to Nick and then John. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm new. Uh, I don't have a lot of paradigms. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't know how you're supposed to talk to fellow councilmen. I don't know how you're supposed to deal with other cities and other organizations. But uh, I learned quick, um, and uh, I, I think it's just a, a, a that's 
basically the difference. John's done a wonderful job over his over his time there, and uh, I just uh, personally feel that it's my turn. That, that's the bottom line. Um, you know, it's hard for me to compare myself to Nick. I, you know, Nick covered things well. Um, I guess what I bring to the table is the experience of having been there and done that, and uh, uh, I too have the ability to work with folks. I've demonstrated that, whether it's um, the person on the street or the commercial business or whatever. Uh, so I guess I bring a lot of experience. I know Nick has a lot of management experience in his career, as do I. So I think we're pretty close in those areas as well. So I guess the big thing is experience. Do you mind if I ask what jobs you did? I mean, what, what, did you, what do you do for Kitsap Transit? What did you do? Um, well, I did a lot of things. Um, I, was, I started out as a woodworker, and then when they started recycling submarines in the shipyard, um, I got involved in that somehow. Because you were a manager or something? And then, then I went through that and became a manager. Uh, I was a, a process manager to start with where I oversaw all of the hazardous material removal in uh, the recycle submarines and surface ships. Um, then I became the environmental safety and health manager for the recycle uh, portion of the shipyard. And uh, then we had a project coming up that was, um, it was the uh, oldest submarine that had been laid up. It was done in 1968, um, and it never had an asbestos abatement. And I felt with my background that I was the guy that should step up and say, uh, I will uh, give up my gravy job for uh, to uh, make sure that this happens properly. And uh, that's what I, I did. And then I finished up my career doing the hazardous material plan for uh, an enterprise in the Long Beach. Um, I started at Kitsap Transit uh, as a bus driver, and I have been in business for myself for about 12 years and decided that, I was kidding with Nick that before we got here, that I wanted one of those no big jobs where somebody tells you to come to work at this time and go home at that time and you're done. So I hired as a bus driver back in 1983, and over the years have moved out of the driver's seat and was in safety and training. And Eventually, um, I was a department director for uh, a good number of years, probably 15, 20 years, uh, which managed uh, a variety of aspects of the transit system from customer service to ride sharing to IT to a number of different areas. And then when the uh, uh, original executive director, Dick Hayes, retired about four years ago, I applied and now I'm the executive director of Kitsap Transit and have been for four years. As far as my city career, I actually started uh, public service, if you will, with the city. I volunteered to be a civil service commissioner and served on their commission for about three years, four years. When a vacancy occurred on the council and some of the council members came and asked if I would apply, uh, which I did, they appointed me back in January of 1983. And I've been with the city in this position through um, the construction of City Hall, we built the fire department, uh, we built the uh, Tremont Bridge, uh, we built the original secondary wastewater treatment facility and since remodeled it. Uh, so, you know, in, in my job there at the city, I've been a part of an awful lot of uh, the city growing up, if you will, or me growing up with the city, one of the three. I was basically born and raised in Fort Orchard, so I've been a part of the city all my life. Thank you, guys. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the time.